Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming this afternoon. We're really glad that you're here. We're going to talk about, uh, yeah, what are we going to talk about here, Michelle? Oh, yeah. The state of DevOps, security yeah. enables velocity, right? Bet you haven't heard that before. Usually it's, no, security drags us down. It makes us slow. That's right. Uh, so hi, my name is Nathan Harvey. I'm a developer advocate with Google Cloud, and I work on this program called Dora, which maybe you've heard, maybe you haven't. But don't worry, we're going to tell you all about Dora over the course of the next few minutes. Yes, we are. And I am Michelle, and I am a cloud security advocate in Google Cloud. But we get along. <laughs> we, we do get along. So yeah. uh, you might say that I represent the DevOps, and Michelle, you represent the security. I do, but uh, funny story, I learned a long time ago that the DevOps people could be my best friends. That's my secret superpower in being in product security, is that I learned, oh, those DevOps people, they talk about efficiency and governance and doing things in the same way. Oh yeah, those are the people I want to be with. Yeah. <laughs> because then I learned how to put my security stuff in what they do. It was, I, it was actually a trick. It was like work smart, not hard. But that's how I got into product security and DevOps. That's how I learned DevOps is from actually just making friends with the DevOps folks. Well, it's good to be friends and it's good to have friends. But honestly, Michelle, your approach doesn't necessarily feel like what we typically hear security's view of DevOps. No, the best compliment slash insult I ever got was when the head of cybersecurity architecture at a bank, which you can see on my resume, told me that, I, oh, Michelle, you sound just like a developer. I said, thank you. I thought it was a great compliment. He was trying to be rude and insult me, so. Oh, well, it's <laughs> certainly a compliment. But, so how do many security folks think about DevOps? Well, you found this great tweet here. <laughs> yes, um, that's what, I, I mean, most of the conversations I have are about no, it's not going to break security. No, it's not the end of the universe. It's actually uh, not this. It's, it's going to help you. Yeah, and for those of you in the back of the room who maybe can't see this, uh, the tweet says, to make mistake is human. To automatically deploy mistake to all of servers is DevOps. Yeah. I mean, that's on a bad <laughs> day, yes, it can be that. But that's not the general rule. Hey, nothing if not consistent, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. So tell me more about security. What's going on here? Oh, OK. Would it be a security talk without the requisite DBIR slide? <laughs> I mean, I feel like it's a requirement that you have to have a slide from the Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report. Have you seen and this? In yeah. a, a, a talk or two mentioned yeah. this okay. week already? Yeah, sure. I see a yeah, yeah. head nods. Yeah. Seventy-four percent of all breaches include the human element with people being involved, oh. right? Error, privilege misuse, yada yada yada, right? I feel like I can yada 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 um, a Verizon data breach investigations report, right? Because I think we've seen a lot of the same information over and over again. And yes, I, so that's what they say. I, I mean I have a small problem with this. Um, 74% of breaches include the human element. <laughs> well, that's what is in orgs. I mean, but <laughs> I, I mean, first, that feels like a little bit of a cop out. I'm pretty sure that there were people involved in every one of those incidents at some level. Right. And second, just throwing up your hands and saying human error, like <laughs> human error is also a cop out. Like if we want to understand why did something break, we can't just say, well, it was a human's fault. Okay, so what do, what do we do when that happens? Like, that doesn't help us at all. So if you've not read this book from Sidney Decker, I would absolutely recommend it here. It's called it's the, the Field Best. Guide to Understanding Human Error. And you see he intentionally, uh, although you like can't put air quotes on a book title, he did put <laughs> human error in quotes here. Because right. you know, human error is not a cause of trouble. It is the consequence, the effect, the symptom. Uh, and you and your organization may well have helped create those conditions. Uh, so leave those conditions in place, and the same bad outcome may happen again. And if you don't know who Sidney Decker is, he is an academic who specializes in uh, safety science and safety culture. And he's, I encourage you, he has a new book out about uh, applying restorative justice. But yeah, he's saying it's, our breaches are the symptom of a bigger problem. Right? 
our incidents and breaches, it's not because humans, because that's what are in organizations. That can't be the problem. That's the thing that runs them, essentially. But it is a consequence. But I mean, Verizon isn't wrong. Things are complex. It's overwhelming. It's Think about when you started, when I started in, in uh, IT. I mean, mm -hmm. it, Kubernetes alone, just look at how complex Kubernetes is. It, you have entire teams of people now who have to manage that platform, as we say now, it's platform engineering. I mean, between the CICD process, the platforms we have, maybe you have an internal developer portal, it's overwhelming. Yeah, there's definitely a lot going on, a lot of surface area, and frankly, lots of places where something could go wrong. And some of those things that might go wrong, maybe will go wrong, will be security related. Um, and when we think about application security, we have concerns all around us, right? I feel like the kid from the sixth sense, right? I see security <laughs> issues all around me. Um, and it's because they are everywhere. I mean, OSS, who here is tired of hearing about the supply chain and open source software? Okay, has it jumped the shark? I, I would say it has, but it's still a problem. It's not really getting any better. And it's because it's in everything, right? Mm -hmm. You can't get away from, I don't think there's a product today that doesn't have any open source in it. No, there probably isn't. Yeah, yeah. we should yeah. do that study. We also have this increasing pace of deployments, right? We, I mean, just look at the name of this talk, Velocity Enables Security, right. or Security Enables Velocity. Yeah, I forget, forget. Which yeah, way we I think we said Security sequence Enables them, but Velocity. It's <laughs> like, they help each other, right? Right. So, and everyone, you know, like, is under pressure to move faster. We need to ship more frequently. We need to get more changes out to our customers. Everybody wants to write new features, right? New, new features feature, 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 yep. feature. Right? Absolutely. And then all the different attack vectors. Now you've got this very complex system, and that gives you an increasing attack surface to take apart and use, right? Mm -hmm. And then the tools, right? Uh, it's I stop looking at tooling for like five minutes, and there are a thousand new tools. Absolutely. I can't keep up with them, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. It used to be the joke that like how many JavaScript frameworks were launched this week? Well, it's Tuesday, so probably seven new JavaScript frameworks. <laughs> right. The rest of the technology uh, teams have like caught up. We want to launch new frameworks this week also, right? So they're just yeah. new tools coming out all the time. So what do you do if something is breached? When? Oh, oh right. That was, <laughs> right. A, that was a bad question. Sorry. I know, What do you do right? when something is breached? When something is breached in your organization, how does your team respond? Well... I think it, we all know how this can go, right? No, it wasn't my fault. Well, it wasn't my fault either. I'm no, no, no. I told you about the thing. I'm a developer. But I told you're you. You're in security. No, but I can't fix the it's, thing. It's no, your code. But it's in the name. My job is no. to develop. Your job is the, to secure. No, it was your job to fix it. <sighs> how I many told times you. have you had this conversation, right? When something is breached, Perhaps security leads to fail, uh, failure leads to scapegoating, and we start finger pointing. It's not my fault. Look, it was secure on my laptop. Nobody breached that. So. How many people have lived this, right? This is the story of our lives if you work in security, right? Yeah. All right. So let's try again. Maybe, maybe this isn't the best response. So look, something was breached here, Michelle. What's going on? Well, the rules. What do you mean, the rules? You didn't follow the rules. Yeah, no, no, no. I, so the rules here, yeah. so you have to be punished now. No, 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 no. I did, I did what I was told. My manager told me to make this feature, and I made the feature. And no, so, the rules. But oh. the rule has an SLA. Yeah, but you, you didn't follow the SLA. The, but, the, it was red, and you need to make it green. But your rule is ridiculous. It's, no, it, red, if I, green. If I follow your rule, I can't stop. ship this feature. I know, but red means stop. No, I think we need to do something about your rules, and maybe about you, Michelle. Uh, okay. Yeah. So. Someone must be punished. Yeah. A breach leads to justice. This is maybe not the best way for us to respond either. <laughs> so, Michelle, this thing was breached. What's going on? I don't know. Let's look at this. Together? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's, yeah, we need to sit down and look at this look. together. Yeah. I, I'm always surprised by this service once it's running yeah. in production. You never know exactly what's going to happen. I know. I'm let's just troubleshoot breached. it. You know what? Yeah. Let's get the network guy, too. Oh, yeah. It's probably the network. Oh, no, no. We're not blaming No, no, right no. No, no blame. No. no we're going to we get need, the network guy to help us. insights yeah. from the networking team yeah. as well. Yeah. And he really yeah. knows how to use Wireshark. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, that's great. Speaking of more tools, right? So, when security failures happen, how does your organization respond? How does your team respond? Do they get to a point where they're pointing fingers, where they're trying to figure out who should we fire? 
or is it actually a, a good, healthy response where we come together and try to figure out what can we learn about this system? Look, we know that humans were involved at least 74% of the time. We can't just get rid of all of the humans. Is Even, there curiosity? I mean, yeah. that's the when you look at problems with curiosity and without blame, where you're separating the deed from the doer, right? It's not about punishment anymore. We're actually looking at it, okay, let's figure this out together. Absolutely. And so this, this is what we want. We want yeah. more of this collaboration. And that collaboration can certainly happen between development and security. And it must happen if we want to have a good response. And this is where Dora comes in. Dora, okay, I know which one it is. Which one? N it, it, it's that one. Uh, the Explorer? Yeah, yeah that door, right? No, no, that's not the door we're talking about. Instead, what we're going to talk about today is this, the this one. Digital Operational yeah, Resilience one. Act. That one. Do that's the door. Do you all know this? Yeah. Have you heard of the Digital Operational Resilience Act? No? It's in Europe. It's it's European it's EU European. legislation. <laughs> so it's that, coming soon. It probably like if you no, work I, with maybe? people in Europe, you might need to know about this in soon place? enough. It's, so that's the Dora. The, no, but that's not the Dora we're talking oh. about today. You can take a picture of that. You should maybe learn about it, but that's not who we're here to talk about today. Instead, we're here to talk this today Dora. about that's this Dora. Dora, DevOps Research and Assessment. And uh, let me just be honest, I hate the word DevOps. Uh, the reason I hate the word DevOps No, is, I, hate, I hate DevSecOps more. Uh, look, <laughs> I, I hate the word DevOps in every permutation of the word DevOps. Why? Because at the end of the day, it's not about how do we make dev and ops better, or how do we make dev and sec and ops better. It's about how do we use technology to drive forward our business. And in order to do that, we need to collaborate with everyone across the business. Just a quick poll. How many of you in the room consider yourself developers? Hands up. OK. Uh, security professionals. OK. Product owners. Uh, business people. Oh, wait. Okay. We, you know, okay. Compliance. People oh, or oh. audit? Compliance? <laughs> compliance? Do we have or any audit? of those? Oh, no, we don't. Right. Okay. Oh, cool. I just want to go back to business people. Can you just put your yeah. hands up for a quick second? Okay. Three and four and a half of you yeah. should keep your jobs. The rest of you should go find another job. Because if you don't care about your business, like why are, why are you oh. doing that job? You should, if you, we are all business people. We all should be caring about who our customers are, who right. our business is. This is, and, and how we use technology to drive our business forward, this is the question of the Dora research and hopefully the question that you're now asking I, yourself. I used to always make a joke about one place where I worked. Um, I hope I don't give it away. They used to say that we're a technology company that happens to be a bank. And I'd say, we use a lot of electricity too. Does that make us an electric company or a utility? <laughs> I mean, the, at, the at the end of the day, we're, we all have customers. We're all here to make people's lives easier or jobs yeah. easier. So yes, we're yeah. business people. We're here to support each other. We have I to think. know what the business of our business and is. No, and I'm I not hope that I hope that you all know <laughs> what the business of your business is. And if not, maybe that's a thing you'll take away from this talk. Go learn what the business of your business is. But Dora is really this research program that is program and platform agnostic that says how do we build high performing, scalable, sustainable teams? Teams that can use technology to create amazing digital experiences for their customers, or even amazing offline experiences for their customers. How do we use technology to drive our business forward? And in doing so, Dora researches a bunch of different capabilities. Capabilities, again, that are program and platform agnostic, but technical capabilities like, hey, if we want to use technology to drive our business forward, you know one thing we should probably all do? Use version control. Right? Like, let's put our code and our configuration in a system where we can track its changes over time. That's a capability that everyone in this room has, right? You all use version control? Just lie to me if you don't. Just <laughs> yeah, know, say right? yes. Yes, yes, please. Yes, just say yes. <laughs> just say yes. Yeah. yeah. So we think about technical capabilities and we research them, but it goes beyond technical capabilities. We also look at things like process capabilities. For example, down there at the bottom, the change approval process. What does your change approval process look like to get a change from committed, developed into production? And do you hand those changes off to an external body, maybe a change approval board who doesn't actually understand any of the systems, but is there to help keep you safe? And then look, what I circled up there, of course, shift left security. Absolutely. Security absolutely matters. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's part of the core model of Dora. That's right. And when we think about these capabilities, what we really see is that these capabilities on the left-hand side 
like shifting left on security, are predictive of some measures that we can use. How do we know if we're doing well with software delivery and operations performance? We have to have some way to measure that. So Dora gives us some measures that we've validated over almost a decade of research. And more important than that, though, I don't just care that you're better at delivering and operating software. What I really care about are some of those organizational outcomes. Are you running a more profitable organization? Are your customers happy? And actually, if you go back a slide, you'll also see on that, on that full right-hand side the well-being of the people on your team. If we and want to encourage collaboration, we have to make sure that our people are engaged in the work and are And happy. that certainly matters in security because how many of you have experienced burnout or know somebody who has experienced burnout in the security industry? I mean, I have tons, right? So those organizational outcomes are critical. Absolutely. And by using some of those measures, those software delivery and operations performance measures, we can actually start to help teams compare themselves to other teams. Or more importantly, you know what's better than comparing yourself to another team? Well, it is another team, but it's your same team six months ago or 12 months ago or six or 12 or 19, 18, 27 months from now. How are you changing over time on your team? And by your team, probably what I mean is your cross-functional team that comes together to build an application or service. So speaking of measures, how do we measure software delivery performance? I'll tell you the one thing it's not, lines of code. Lines of code is a terrible yeah. measure for just about anything, right? It's certainly not a good measure of developer productivity. It's definitely not a good measure for how secure are we. Well, maybe. No. If the lines of code are going down, we might be getting more secure. Yeah, that's possible. Yeah, that's yeah, possible because yeah, I've that, seen lots of code where you just have you have yeah. whole functions that aren't being used. Yes. Yeah, that's maybe. All right, but we use we use these four metrics. Sometimes you'll hear Dora referred to as the Dora metrics or the four keys from Dora. These are our software delivery metrics, and what these are really measuring are these four questions. How long does it take us to go from code committed all the way through to that code is running in production? And how frequently are we changing our production systems? And when we do change production, how frequently do we have to say, oh my gosh, stop, roll it back, or push forward a hot fix. We've got to fix this immediately. We would call that a change failure. And then, in addition to that change failure, when something like that happens, how long does it take you, your team, your system to recover from that incident? Maybe to roll back or to get your customers back into a state where they're happy. Now taken together, we can use these four metrics on any sort of technology that you're delivering. It doesn't matter if you're, if you're delivering code to a mainframe. You, you worked on mainframes. Hey. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I worked on mainframes too. That, I'm sorry, that sounded a little judgy. It was not meant as such. But your mainframe, your mobile application, your Kubernetes cluster, we can use those same four measures regardless. Well, and not only that, I've created another slide right yeah. after this one how to show this, you the perspective from security. How does it relate to security? I mean, okay. Yeah. Now, I just took a shot at this, Nathan, so forgive right. me if I, uh, but I looked at it from the perspective of software security delivery performance. And yeah. how can we think about that, right? Lead time for vulnerability remediation. Okay, that's fair. Change security failure rate. Did I do put through a change that then caused a failure? Yeah. Or security feature deployment frequency. Security, I assert, is a product feature. That's something that is, customers want that. It should be baked into your product. So that should be, that's a consideration, right? Um, failed re deployment recovery time when you have a bug. And that could be a security bug or any kind of bug, right? You see where we're going here with this? That it's like you can think about it for everything? Yeah. yeah? Yeah. Another thing that's really important, though, if you look at those four measures, the two on the left, those are kind of velocity measures or throughput measures. And the two on the right are more on the stability side. Here's a failure scenario. All right. You all on this side of the room, you're responsible for that throughput, that velocity. You all on this side of the room, you're responsible for that stability keep everything stable. Now, I used to be a sysadmin. I used to run <laughs> operations. I'm on this side of the room. You know how I win? You know how I get my bonus? What do I have to do? Slow them down. I slow them down. <laughs> I, do, I do better than that because I'm really good at my job. I just say no. No changes. No changes. And now we all get a bonus and a promotion. Congratulations this side of the room. I'm sorry. 
we stopped you from getting any of your features out and your manager's going to be I unhappy. used to be on that side of the room mm -hmm. and then I learned I started to go over to that side of the room and then I realized that it's more kind of a mix in the yeah. middle, right? Yeah. Well, the truth is we can't just separate those out. We have to own shared accountability and responsibility for them. That's how, remember we're business people, that's how we're gonna drive right. our businesses forward, keep our customers happy. And as it turns out, when we look at these measures, and so the way that Dora works, very briefly, we each year we collect a bunch of data from around the world, from organizations of every shape and size in every vertical industry, whether it's a 150-year-old bank or a two-month-old technology startup. We collect data from these folks. And what we're able to do when we look at those four metrics together is identify various performance levels for applications or teams. Now, this year we found four different levels. We called them low, medium, high, and elite. Unfortunately, each one of those labels sounds kind of judgy. Elitist. Yeah, maybe elitist. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. But here's, here's the most important thing about them is that the best performers perform well on all four of those metrics. And the lowest performers, they perform, unfortunately, uh, 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 they have a lot of opportunity to improve all four of those metrics. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes, yes. So this is my favorite part of the State of DevOps report, which we'll be talking about, and we'll have a QR code so you can download this later. But um, that having security teams work alongside developers and collaborating increases trust mm -hmm. and confidence in the changes being deployed. What does that say? That says that we need to get along. Yeah, and, and this idea of collaborating is so super important. I, I also love the, the, the point about trust. Look, hmm. I, I heard once from a very smart software engineer that every bit of code, every bit of code that we write is just an experiment. And actually writing code is a continual experiment. And so how do we get faster feedback on the experiments that we're running? And by doing so, we're building trust. And hmm. so if we can build trust together with our peers from the security team and, and organization, that can really help. And the, the, the biggest takeaway in the, in the research from the decade or so that we've been running this research is just that, that the stability and velocity are not trade-offs of one another. In fact, no. in order to be safe, in order to be stable, you have to be fast. And the counter, you know, like I've worked with so many banks who say, no, you know what, we're a regulated industry, we are very risk averse, we know that if we move slow, everything will be better, it will be safer, and will be good. Except every single one of them sometimes has to move fast because all of a sudden there's a zero day vulnerability. We have to fix that today. Actually, we should have fixed it yesterday, but we didn't know about it yesterday. So now we have to fix it today. And those organizations don't have the muscle. They don't understand what it means to move fast. So what happens? They take away all their guardrails, they move really fast, <laughs> and they break things. It's, it's like the idea in Nassim Taleb where he talks about anti-fragile that those who, for example, I think he said that cab drivers at some point were uh, more resilient to failure because they have this very dynamic, anti-fragile kind of work. And that's actually what we're looking for here is anti-fragility. If you build that muscle of velocity, um, you're actually gonna be more likely to respond uh, effectively when there is a breach or some kind of zero day that comes out and you have to like log 4J where you have to, I mean, how many times did people have to update things that week of, what was it, Thanksgiving or something? It was, it was, it was a Christmas. nightmare, right? It was Christmas, it was a nightmare. Thanks for bringing it back oh, to sorry. all of us. Yeah. PTSD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A yeah. little bit, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, right, so, but here's, here's a couple of other things that we find in our research. Those best performers are twice as likely to have security integrated into their software development processes. So if you wanna be good, we do have to partner, we do have to work together, but not only that, those performers that are integrating those security practices see better organizational performance. It's not that they're not doing it. It means that they're doing it more effectively and more efficiently. Absolutely, yeah. and they're, they get, have happier customers, more profit. Yeah. Security doesn't have to be the department of or no. if you're Or if you're a nonprofit, you're, you have maybe happier students because you're yep. remediating bugs, you're introducing new features. Absolutely, we're in DC, happier constituents. Yes. There we go. That's All my right. favorite word, yeah. constituents. So, so speaking of security practices, like what do we have to do? Well, 
obviously testing, right? Yeah. That's something that elite performers are going to do. Everybody has to test for security and you do it pretty much everywhere, right? You validate it as part of your automated testing process. You don't want to stop everything for some manual testing. I think everybody knows about that. Um, you want to integrate security into every phase of your development. That means you start thinking about a new feature. You and Now, hopefully, you don't have to stop and say, oh, I got to talk to a security person. Hopefully, they're communicating well, maybe through patterns and reference models and guidelines and policies and standards. Not that those are rules that they want to hit you over the head with, but guidance, right? People want to know. They want to see things written down so they can think and cogitate on their own, right? Mm -hmm. um, you perform security reviews, right, for major features. You don't have to do it for the smallest ones, but maybe you pick based on risk. You're doing, you're building pre-approved code, right? You have, a, you have libraries, you have reference models, you have packages, tool chains that they can consume and makes life easier for everybody, right? They feel empowered. That is really important for developers to feel autonomous and empowered. Um, and then you invite security to the table all the time, right? How many times, those of you who are in security, where you got left out and they just didn't invite you and you, they invite you like five days before release and your, your feelings are hurt, your ego's hurt, you're mad, you, you feel like you can't do your job and then you don't want to help them, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And unfortunately, you know, when we think about the entire development process, there are so many places where we need help from security. Yeah, we don't have to like read this. I think no. everybody knows all these parts. This is your typical CI CD process, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and security risks are everywhere, right? Mm. I, again, back to that kid from the fifth element, uh, uh, not the sixth fifth sense. element, the sixth <laughs> sense, fifth element, sixth sense. No, it's yeah, a different yeah, movie. Yeah, buddy. totally different yeah. movie, both with Bruce totally Willis, different. though, I'm pretty sure. Anyhow, uh, yeah, so uh, look, we talk in, in our research, we continually find this idea that collaboration with security leads to improved delivery performance and improved security quality. And frankly, as a developer, I, I like this last bit here. I want to spend significantly less time remediating security issues. And, and frankly, yeah. The time that I do spend remediating security issues, I want that to be low stress time. So if I can remediate security issues before they're released to production, that's certainly less stressful, less critical from a time perspective than things that are already out there. Yeah, alive. and it's less stressful for security people too because you're not getting called at the last minute and asked for, what do we hate? Exceptions. No, like how many of us have had the 11th hour exceptions because they didn't invite you or they didn't listen to you or they didn't want to remediate it because nobody knew whose responsibility it was. I mean, standard, right? The exceptions. Yeah. So speaking of security and Dora, what is this uh, SAM? Who's SAM? S Software Assurance Maturity Model. Right. It's an OWASP thing, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Well, Dora and OWASP SAM complement each other, right? Um, that is the way that you achieve quality software because now you're talking to people, right? So governance and design and implementation and verification, all this is gonna go smoother, right? This isn't just sort of this abstract model anymore. This is a way of thinking in terms of your DORA capabilities. How am I gonna align those two together? The, the alignment of the two will help you achieve that quality software that you're looking for. I would challenge you to go if you aren't familiar with SAM, I'm hoping people are, I think it's great. Um, I would encourage you to take SAM and then look at it in the context of DORA, those DORA like attributes, those capabilities, and see how you can use them together to build better, secure quality software. Yeah, and you know, we've been talking a lot about collaboration and building better together. This all starts to feel a lot like culture, doesn't it? And how, what is culture, right? Culture is the free yogurt you get at breakfast. It's, no. In fact, it's full no. of cultures, right? No. No? It's no. Um, it's, it's the, the other culture. It's the foosball <laughs> table that you have, uh, all no, of no, that. No, no. It's no? That okay. other thing. All right. So here, Sociology. Here's, here's a great definition <laughs> from a sociologist named Ron Westrom. Uh, culture is defined as the organization's pattern of response to the problems and opportunities it encounters. So when your organization runs into a problem, how does it respond? When it runs into an opportunity, how does it respond? 
Well, we have a way to test this, and we actually use this as part of our survey methodology each year. We put these statements in front of you. Think about the team that you're working on right now. How much do you strongly disagree or strongly agree with these statements? On my team, new ideas are welcomed. On my team, information is actively sought. On my team, responsibilities are shared. Now, you right now can take that and think and just average them all out in your head. Don't worry, no one's going to check your math. Right, and, every, and for the nerds, that's a Likert seven-point scale. Yeah, everyone has, has, <laughs> has your number here. All right, so what this reveals and what, what Westrom brought to us through his research is this topology of organizational cultures. And Westrom has identified three different sort of prototypes or prototypical different types of culture. Now, the truth is, well, there are two things I'm going to say that are true. One, when you look at this chart, you see where you are right now. You know where your team is on this chart. Like you are, There are things here that you're reading that resonate with you. Two, although there are three columns, you should really think of this as a continuum. You aren't necessarily only a performance-oriented organization, and you aren't necessarily only a power-oriented organization. Yeah, and not only that, think of it in terms of the social ecological model. I know, I know, it's a sociology thing. The personal, the intrapersonal, the interpersonal, and then the societal. So in an organization, you're gonna have those layers and that's how you can look at that. And if you recognize this, it's the same columns from the beginning. Um, the, <laughs> that's what we were acting out, right? We were acting out these models. And the last one is really what you seek to encourage is that generative model. Yes, generative. See, Westrom was ahead of his time. He knew that generative AI was coming. <laughs> no, and so it's if he not that generative. Oh, no, it's not that generative. No, it's no, not no, that no, generative. no. It's, he also called it performance oriented, which is a much you're better. Just straight man. <laughs> yeah, you are just my straight <laughs> man, yes. But here's, here's another quick thing I want to point out as you look at the picture that you've taken of this slide, and I'm sure we're going to publish the slides, but look at that bottom row. And for those of you in the back, it might be hard to read the bottom row, but here's the truth leaders, leaders really shape the culture of an organization, how a leader shows up what incentives they reward, like how their reward well, system is structured. But let's, let's, I challenge you for a different interpretation of that. Sure. Because as Simon Sinek says, leadership isn't a role, it's not management, it's, it's a mission, right? It's an idea. And so we all get to be leaders in our organizations. Right? And, it's a choice. Yeah, that, that is true, although we don't all get to decide how bonuses get paid. Okay, that's fair enough. Right, and, that, enough. Does, and that does matter, <laughs> right? True. And so when you look at this leadership row at the bottom here, what's the leader's focus? In that pathological or power-oriented, the leader's focused on their own personal needs. How do I prove that I'm the best? In that bureaucratic or rule-oriented organization, they're focused on departmental turf. How do I build my fiefdom? and say that my team is the best team in this organization. Without my team here, everything's going to fall apart. Why is that? Well, because we hoard information, we hide everything from everyone else, we don't collaborate, and so if we're not here, the whole thing's going to fall down. In, in a performance-oriented organization, the leader's focused on the mission. Why are we here? W one of the biggest things, like one of the biggest tells, if Michelle and I are on two different teams, we report to two different vice presidents within the organization. Here's the question, are we allowed to talk to each other or do we have to pogo stick through the organizational hierarchy in order to exchange information? I've had to do that. When you're pogo sticking, you are likely in a bureaucratic or rule-oriented organization. We're not allowed to talk to each other because that's against the policy. That's not the, how the rules work. I wasn't even allowed to in one place. I wasn't even allowed to email somebody in a higher pay band than me without including my boss who was in that higher pay band. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. That's true. It's a real thing. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, let's uh, let's continue on here. Look, culture drives performance, and in fact, what we see is that those teams with the performance-oriented cultures have 30% better overall organizational performance. And of course, it also drives the well-being of the people on your team. With the right culture in place, you're going to decrease well, burnout. Nobody wants to work in a place that can't get things done. Nobody likes working there. Absolutely. Right? I mean, that's my that's what I've experienced. Yes. Yeah. I mean, developer happiness and developer productivity. Like, which comes first? Are you and happy because you're productive, or are you productive because you're happy? Maybe the answer is yes. And it's interesting. I I don't know if people knew this, but Google Cloud. When we talk about developers. 
we don't mean we don't just mean SWEs. When we talk about developers, we're talking about implementers, we're talking about anyone who interacts with cloud. So maybe it's a great idea, because the term developer is yes. so positive, maybe we need to expand what we think of as that term developer, because we're all, in a way, developers. We're to developing, we're helping to develop absolutely. a product. Absolutely, just like we're all business people now, right? Yeah, right. All right, so, and culture <laughs> so matters for security too. It does, I think if we've all been burned out or known somebody who's been burned out, the thing to know when you look back on that, you think about the environment, right? And so, and it's not just our anecdotal information, it's research. There are people out there who study this. They study human-centered security, uh, behavioral information security, and what they're finding, I'm seeing the same things over and over again when I pull this research, that formal controls and security policies do not correlate to voluntary security behaviors. That made me almost fall out of my chair when I read that finding. Um, and it's a good study, by the way. This is an excellent study. But what? So if I have rules, that doesn't make people want to follow them? What? And then not only that, that deterrent approaches, oh, oh you went sorry. ahead, that fear appeals, uh, which are pretty common, deterrent approaches, uh, sanctioning, they correlate to reduced voluntary security behaviors. You're not gonna scare people into doing the right things either. And it increases apathy and resistance because it's kind of a boy who cried wolf thing, right? Oh, they're always telling me to be worried about this, these zero days and these threats and these APTs. I'm it's like, I'm, it's, that's all you hear after a while, right? So it doesn't actually do anything. And then individuals who are committed, responsible and accountable which is what we want, right? Um, that's towards the protection of organizations' information resources. That's known as stewardship, by the way, that they're more likely to engage in voluntary security behaviors. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? We want people who care about where they work, who identify with where they work, and who feel supported by their organizations and by each other. So if we create that kind of environment, then we've created a culture, a security culture, that's going to actually encourage people to do the right thing. And not just stand by. Yeah, well, exactly. Um, Irvin Staub's uh, bystander theory, uh, you have this idea of active and passive bystanders. And the idea is that passive bystanders, for the most part, people, don't want to step up. That's not their inclination because you're self-protecting, right? And so when you're in a group, it especially becomes you're even more or less likely to step up. So because you think the other person is going to do it. And if no one intervenes, this interesting thing happens, people start to think that that's the correct behavior, that that's implicitly allowed. So what we want is we want to encourage active bystanders, not passive bystanders. We want to inspire active bystandership to discourage that inappropriate activity. I wonder if there's something here that we can learn from incidents. You know, things go wrong. Right. Uh, and, and I don't know, maybe you've heard of the incident command system. If you're the first person on the scene, the incident command system says you are the yeah. incident commander you have the most context about yeah. this incident right now. Now, at some point, you might hand that off, right? But if I'm a developer if I, or I'm, I'm just a, a citizen on the street and I walk up to a fire, like, I know more about this fire than anyone else right now, so I'm in charge. Hopefully, a professional will come along and I can hand off incident command because <laughs> you, you don't want me in charge of that. But maybe it, as we get better also at learning from incidents and collaborating through that, that can help us. Well, there's a this. similar concept in restorative justice, uh, which is called conflicts as property. And it, it says that the more often you hand off responsibility for something, that you actually become disempowered, that it disempowers the victim, it disempowers the perpetrator. It's just, it, it's a very um, detached way of dealing with wrongdoing. And that the idea is that you want to not give up that property. And so I created something called compliance as property, where you don't just say, oh, I don't, uh, that's the security person's job. Nope, you own it. <laughs> that's, you need to run it down. You own that. Yeah, absolutely. 
So here's an example of how security or how, this is one example of what I use when I, when I uh, collaborate with uh, DevOps teams. I created my own DevOps uh, security maturity model. And what I do is I used to go to every organization and I would say, hey, we're the DevOps people, show me. And they would put me there and then I would just embed my model into theirs because I wanted to align. I wanted to create less friction and more alignment. This is just one method of doing that, right? Um, you know, I use uh, people, process, technology, and culture, but I would change it if they didn't have that. If they use slump something slightly different, I'd retool it. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, this is how I would sell it <laughs> to the DevOps team. Um, I have this whole model, if anybody's interested. Uh, probably not the most exciting thing, but you know, it's, it works very well if you're wanting to create that alignment and that partnership with your DevOps folks. And I love how you have te technology, process, people, and culture. And obviously we've been talking a lot about culture today. And the truth is that culture is something that is, is always changing, but it's also very difficult to change. So I like to go back to this saying that's been around for a long time. The saying is it's easier to work your way into a new way of thinking than it is to think your way into a new way of working. So what does that mean? How do we change culture? We cannot separate culture from technology. The way that we work, the tools that we use, inform the culture that we have. And I'll give you a really quick, very simple example. Think back to a, some of you are gonna have to go ask your parents maybe, but think back to a time where the way that we shared information was by shipping around Google Docs, uh, I'm sorry, Microsoft Word Docs or, or any <laughs> form of document via email. I want input on this strategic plan, so I'm gonna send it out to 17 different people. And what I get back are 17 new copies of that same strategic plan. Underscore Chaburka. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I end up with a document that has underscore right. Chaburka, underscore Harvey, underscore final, underscore final two, underscore final final, like terrible. And then we collectively moved to something more like Google Docs where we're online sharing that information, collaborating in real time, able to comment in the doc and everyone can see those comments. We changed the tooling and that changed the way that we share information. That changed the culture and the process of how we work together. So unfortunately, too many organizations say, you know what, we need to fix our culture. So the month of October is gonna be culture innovation month. All right, well that didn't work. Now it's November, let's try Tools Innovation Month. The truth is you can't separate the two. No. They, they feed on and amplify one another. All right, we're, we wanna save at least one minute for questions. So to yeah. wrap up very quickly, uh, we strongly encourage you to go and grab our research. Go read the uh, 2023 Accelerate State of DevOps report. You can grab it there at dora.dev slash report. And for those of you that can't get the picture in time, I have some cards up here that I'll give you at the end. And then one final thought, uh, look around. No one in this room has all of the answers. Neither do Michelle or myself. So the truth is you can't do this alone. And we want you to learn from one another. This is why you come to a conference, to meet others who are on this same journey. We also wanna continue that conversation through the Dora community. If you wanna join that, it's a mailing list where we get together and we discuss these topics. We have online meetings regularly as well so that we can meet in and a more security synchronous. security people are invited. Absolutely. Want the security people. And remember, um, the idea of the expert is kind of over. It, we become experts together and questions don't simply access information, they create experience, right? So this is how we're going to be curious yes. and learn from each other. Absolutely. And with that, we have time for one question. Oh, but you can <laughs> applaud first, that's well, fine. We're the, last, we're the last group in the room, so if you wanna go over, the proctor was cool. So. All right, do we, one question that we can answer. Yes, there's one right back here, and then. Can you, in a hierarchical, oh. Yeah, thank you. fancy. In a hierarchical organization, uh -huh. very bureaucratic, Yes. if you're on the, the low end of the food chain, so to speak, how can you um, effectively message, I know you said we, don't, we can't do this alone, but how can you effectively message that, or effectively, uh, I can't think of the word. Um, you you wanna change advocate. that Advocate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For a better culture. Uh huh. 
Yeah. So I'll give you uh, two pieces of advice that, uh, and, and they're like every piece of advice that you're going to receive. Like maybe they'll work, maybe they won't. My first piece of advice to you is to find the team that you're having trouble because you, in a bureaucratic organization, right, oftentimes you're discouraged from partnering, working with other teams. The first piece of advice I give you is go and just sit with that other team. Like through the work that you do, demonstrate that collaboration is the thing that's going to lead to a better outcome. So that's advice number one. Advice number two is find the leader above, and it doesn't have to be your manager or even in your direct line. Maybe it's on that other team, but find someone who is open to changing the way that things work and go and talk and listen to them so that as you're describing the change that you want reflected, you can use the leader's language to help get other leaders on board. And as you demonstrate that collaboration, enlist that leader as your advocate. They need to go tell other leaders, hey, we can do better. The other leaders aren't going to listen to you. I have a slightly different approach, but then I also have a sociology background. Um, I, if you've ever heard of narrative inquiry or compassionate witnessing, um, empathy. Um, a lot of times it's just asking the questions. I remember I, I recently took a, a narrative inquiry course and it's all about asking questions and externalization and all this other stuff, but just being curious and asking the person, hey, what's that like for you? What do you need? What's important to you? And now all of a sudden, you've shown that you care, and t the heuristic of tit for tat is usually going to flip it the other way around. Now all of a sudden they're going to care about you. So that's what I tend to use. I mean, um, you can, there are a lot, it, it's, there's also something called appreciative inquiry. These are all positivist kind of uh, uh, psychology movements as well, but um, that's what I tend to use myself. But. All right. Thank you. And with that, thank you once again. We are at time. Please do take a red or a green card at the end. Yes, and take, take door cards. And if take you're interested cards. in learning more, you can grab one of these Please. on your way out, except you have to come to the front. It's not really on your way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah but you, we don't, you don't have to thank us or anything thank you. like that. Yeah. Yeah.